you have to love the world in some way in order to be so scarred by it, in order to uh, to betray it. And that, that might be why uh, Satan, Satan came from, oh no, it was, it was Lucifer, Lucifer in Paradise Lost, who was once the, the greatest angel and then became, so this person, this embodiment of a diabolical evil. And actually I have maybe another idea we can discuss later about, uh, you, you know, Heidegger's famous theory of uh, unframing as part of technology. I think what, what he was describing in unframing is the process of radical evil or the process of this thoughtlessness in the sense of what you're doing in unframing is you're creating a dichotomy and not recognizing the, the shifting nature of that dichotomy and how two things can be dichotomous in one aspect, but also different but also different and similar in some other aspects. And then this non-fluidity of thought that creates radical evil. But then I, well, I, and another idea that we can maybe explore later after we uh, got through this episode is what exactly is the relationship between radical evil and diabolical evil? Because I, I'm really puzzled by it. I, I haven't got an answer. Yeah, I think that this idea is definitely very interesting, and especially if we we're talking about it in Heideggerian terms, and, and definitely touches upon the idea of existential evil to some degree to say, or not evil, but just suffering in general, almost a tragic nature. And there's this question, is tragedy evil in itself, is, is to experience that evil in that? I wouldn't necessarily say that that's the case, though. But I do think that there's a part of being human, which is in its nature, tragic. And, and precisely in the way that you kind of display it, in the sense that the more you love something, the more it hurts you, and the more you hate it to some degree. And Though I would at the same time say that that is perhaps not diabolical evil in the sense that it makes diabolical seem too sweet. It makes it seem too bittersweet to say, well, oh, you um, you make that evil or or you're committing evil through your love or your beauty towards a certain action. I would say perhaps that's not the depth of diabolical evil, but rather that precisely having love and evil so close together seems to suggest that that is precisely the tragedy of humanity, that the more you love something, the more it hurts you. And per perhaps you will look directly to um, the situation of Mushkin in The Idiot, where you have uh, where you have Mushkin loving the world so much, even though it throws like sticks and stones against him. And whether he suffers in general, I mean, that's one of the main critiques of that work to say, well, he actually doesn't, he's a very one-sided character in the sense that it doesn't seem that he's suffering, but, but, but perhaps by making him more human, my, my, by making Mushkin more human, you perhaps have a Mushkin which is suffering, and that's us in the sense that we love the world to some degree, and precisely because of our love, there seems to be um, seems to lead to that hatred, perhaps, and and that's perhaps a different situation entirely from diabolical evil. And perhaps we can now um, talk a bit more about the difference between radical evil and diabolical evil, because that might. Well, actually, shed that actually, I want to. I, want, I kind of want to uh, follow the line of Mushkin. All right, mm -hmm. So there's. I've been reading a lot of. Uh, a lot of things about Buddhism recently. And there's an idea in Buddhism that there, there's sort of a, this higher level of uh, enlightenment and this lower level of enlightenment. And the lower li level of enlightenment is sort of when you detach from everything, you lack any attachment, so you don't feel any suffering. You're, you're kind of just floating floating around, sort of not feeling anything in, in this constant blissful state. But what the Buddha says is that it's it's not true enlightenment, because the true enlightenment is when you, you feel that state and you realize that it's not real enlightenment and you have to come back to love the world again and to devote yourself to the world completely to help everyone else move move from so move away from evil. And the question I have and the one that I can't resolve, and I think it might be solved through this, this Mushkin phenomenon, is that how can the Buddha come back to love the world without being hurt by it or without suffering? It seems to me that whenever you love something, and maybe technically, technically speaking, I can use philosophical jargon, that you may have desire and you may have care. And care is generated by love. And care is this second order desire or this meta desire for for your desires and for what you want to do. And once you put care into something, it's a very dangerous act. Because once you put care into it, you, you're you constrained in your desire first. And second, you would be hurt completely if 
that thing you care about is destroyed. Uh, less so when you desire that thing. But he's curious this high level of desire. And well, the, the question then is, do you, do you think Mushkin can shed light on this phenomenon of how you can love the world, come back and love the world without being radically hurt by it? I definitely think that's definitely a possibility. And I, and maybe one of the things you can look about is turn to the later work Brothers Karamazov and say, well, perhaps Fathers of Sima sheds light on why Mushkin is so monolo mon monologic. I think that's the terminology. Mm. I, it's a long yeah. time since I... That's, a, that's the black team. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that, uh, that that's perhaps one of the reasons why you get the analysis of Zosima, who says you should not be afraid of human sin, but to love man in this sin. And perhaps part of that love of the world, or at least this higher love of the world, is to understand that it will fall and to accept it. And to love both the good and the evil of man. Not necessarily to say that the evil is good, rather to have that acceptance and understand that the world is itself both good and evil, and that to understand what it means to be human is precisely to be both good and evil. And when you look at the Nietzschean um, program to go beyond good and evil, the Mushkin, a Mushkin would then say, well, that is actually wrong in the sense that you should not be trying to go beyond good and evil, but rather to, to be between good and evil in some degrees and say, well, that is precisely the state in which man is experiencing the human condition in the greatest um, order to say, well, they're experiencing both the good and the evil at the same time simultaneously. And, and via loving the fact, loving man, man defined as the person or the being who is wrestling between good and evil constantly. And by loving that state, then you're able to understand both the evil and the good and love it and not be hurt by it, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's so, almost seems like it's also the state of God. So in mm -hmm. the traditional theodicy, right? God sends man into the world and provides them with freedom. And it is this freedom that is God's almost greatest love because you're not constraining yourself to good or evil, but allowing you to make your autonomous choices and make, make it possible for you to really love and for you to really do good. But at the same time, it's a, an act of tremendous courage from love, uh, from God, because he has to allow... Uh, I guess creatures, creatures that he he most love to run the risk of evil and suffering, and that might be the only way to go go about it. And it's, it's the same thing when a great mother sort of lets lets her child uh, go out in the world, even though she knows that they're going to be hurt. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that's the case, and and it's precisely understanding the fact that that is what God intends to be the world. It's precisely what we are interacting with when we are talking about that evil, and why does God allow for this evil to exist? It's precisely that He understands that good and evil is necessary in order for us to understand and for for us to develop. And in some sense, I think that this is what Leibniz means by the best of all possible worlds. Not that there is no suffering in it, but rather that this is the world in which man is perfectly placed in between good and evil and has to fight between both of these these ideals and to choose between the two.